said, make sure you come back tonight for Genesis. Uh, some people say, well, I'm a New Testament Christian. I think we're uh, both Testament Christians uh, because we learn a lot about our God and our beginnings in what we commonly call the Old Testament, although that's a wrong nomenclature. It should be the Hebrew Bible. Um, it's old. Well, it sounds like it's old passé. It's not. It is not. We need, to go, uh, we need to go to the Hebrew Bible to learn about our beginnings. And it teaches us much about our faith. You all know that this week there was a, a passing of one of the greats of our faith. Uh, Billy Graham passing. Uh, we have had the privilege to live in such a time as to see a man live out his faith to the end. What a legacy he has left. What a challenge his life is to all of us to be faithful to what God has called us to do to the end. And so Billy Graham has given us, given us a challenge through his life. I want to read you one of his quotes that has a lot of theological impact. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, correct? It is God's job to judge. It is my job to love. That's accurate. That's very accurate. I've told you these things before. I don't have to judge. Not my job. That is so freeing to me that I don't have to judge people. My job is to love. And so again, Billy Graham said it very truly, very accurately. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It is God's job to judge. It is my job to love. And that's what we are called to do. By this all will know that we belong to Him. By our love that we have for one another. Would you all please join me in prayer? Father, we do thank you that we can gather and we can worship the Most High King. We are thankful that we can come together and enjoy worship. Father, I pray that you would remind my brothers and sisters that it is not biblical for them to be spectators in worship. We're not sitting in a movie theater or in our living rooms. Your expectation is that those who sit in the pew are much more than spectators. They are participants. Many who sit in these pews, most, I believe, are children of yours. And we have been saved by grace and we are kept by grace. And we have many, many reasons to thank you and praise your name. And when your word is spoken, you expect for us to learn. And so, Lord, I pray that you would remind all of us we are active participants in this wonderful privilege of worshiping the Most High God who created, created the earth and the heavens. Father, we ask that you would watch over the Graham family as they grieve and as they celebrate the life of Billy Graham. We pray that his legacy would go on and Lord, we ask that you would watch over those in our church family today. Many have had good news this week. Many have had bad news. Some are struggling with the same health issues, a nagging cough, a nagging headache, backache, knee ache. 
Some, Father, are wondering, how serious is this? Would you please give them peace? Would you please guide them? Would you touch them and heal them as only you can? And if it be your will, Father, many times you work through doctors, work through the doctors. Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless our church family with unity and love. That when visitors walk into this church, they would recognize there's something different here. There's something authentic. That the people here seem to genuinely love God and love each other. Oh God, if we could be known for that. Father, it is our goal as a church to teach truth and love well. To teach your truth. Because we long to be disciples, learners, who are growing to be more like Jesus every day. And as we live faithful lives, you offer us rewards that we will receive at the Bama seat before Jesus. And we long for that day. And we long for that day when Jesus comes back. It could be today. We long for that time when Jesus comes back and calls us up to meet him in the clouds and forever we will be with him. Lord, may that be today. Now, Lord, I ask again for your help. You must preach through me. You must teach through me because you love those who are here today deeply, so much so that you gave your son. And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach your truth through me. Convict us, Father, and give us peace where you want us to have peace. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There was a very wealthy man, very wealthy southern man, who was uh, going to the undertaker to make plans for his funeral. And when he went there, he had a rather odd request. He said, Sonny, this is what I want you to do. I want that casket there with that big one right there. And I've already given instructions. This is what's going to happen when I die. Those in my company are going to take much of my wealth and they're going to convert it. And they're going to convert it to gold bars. So I want a heavy coffin because I want you to take those bars, put them in a couple suitcases, and I want them in that casket with me. You understand? <laughs> so the wealthy old man died and everything was followed through. And lo and behold, he finds himself at the pearly gates before Peter with two suitcases filled with gold. You all realize this is not a theologically accurate story, right? <laughs> just, just let me make sure that you, this, this is not coming out of here. I just want to make sure you know that, okay? And, and St. Peter checks the book and says, I'm sorry, I don't see your name here. And wealthy well, old businessman said, just a second there, son. Check what I got here. St. Peter comes out. And he opens up the suitcase and he sees the gold and his jaw drops. And the wealthy businessman goes, well, what you got to say now? Peter looked at him and he said, pavement? You brought pavement? <laughs> you see, we make the mistake of thinking what is valued on earth is valued in heaven. What works on earth works in heaven. What gives us security on earth gives us security in heaven. And it does not. It does not. This morning, James takes a bit of a turn when he hits chapter 5 and we're talking to another audience. And it's a wake-up call. Especially for the wealthy, a warning to the wealthy, but it's also for us too. Would you please open up your Bibles to the book of James in chapter 5. As you page to the back of your Bible, you will find the book of Hebrews. That's pretty easy to find. Then you'll find James. You see 1st or 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd or 3rd John, Revelation. You've gone too far. The book of James, chapter 5. I want to read the scripture for us first so that you have a flavor of what James has written. James chapter 5, starting in verse 1, James says this, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, 
and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. How's that for an encouraging message? God's word I always find encouraging. Even the warnings. For God in his grace and his mercy wants us to know what is coming. And so James takes a turn and comes and gives a warning here. And the first thing I want you to see is that James gives a warning that judgment is coming. Now here's the question. Scholars disagree on who James is talking to. But James wrote this book to believers. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes who were dispersed abroad. Greetings. And he goes on to call them brethren. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. Some scholars say in chapter 5, verse 1, James is talking to Christians, believers, who are rich. Others say, no, no, no. He is talking to the ungodly. Those who are living their lives for themselves. Those who are apart from Christ and have little to nothing to do with God. I'm of the opinion that it's the second, the latter, that James is talking to. I believe James is talking to ungodly men and women. They are not believers. They are not Christians. I believe that because he says misery is coming upon you. That sounds like horrible judgment, which will not be for the believer. Their actions demonstrate that they are people who are living apart from God. The actions that he depicts in these six verses. And then he talks about the day of slaughter. That does not sound like the judgment for a believer. I'm convinced that James is talking to unbelievers. So if he's writing a book that's going to be read in the synagogue or amongst Christians, why would he address ungodly people? Because they are there too. You do know that. On any, any given day, there would be plenty of unbelievers earning their own way to heaven. Maybe they're in the synagogue or in church or in gatherings. Again, I remind you, churches had not been formed yet. But the believers typically met in synagogues. There were unbelievers there. As a matter of fact, that's one of my great concerns in churches around America this morning and around the world. There are people who are apart from Christ. And they think their attendance is getting them to heaven, and it will not. They think giving will get them to heaven, but it will not. You see, only one thing gets you to heaven, and God has made it very, very clear. It's faith alone in Christ alone that he paid for our sins. And so while it's a great thing to be in church, it's a great thing to give to the purposes of God, and God wants you to, make no mistake, that will not get you to heaven. Please listen to my words. There'll come a day when it's too late. So why address the ungodly? Because James knew that they were ungodly in their midst and a heart for God was to stir them and disturb them and so that they would come to Christ what is the significance of it for us today after all the title that I've given this is a warning to the wealthy 
why would we have to hear this? We're not wealthy. Well, in biblical terms, we are. Uh, in biblical terms, to be wealthy would be to have more than your needs met and readily available each and every day. Even in worldly standards today, we're wealthy. If you look around the world, we're wealthy folks in comparison to most countries. We live well. We have refrigerators and full of food. Uh, some of you have uh, a lot of gift cards full so you can go out and buy food at the restaurants. But we're not wondering where our next meal comes from or where we'll, when we'll get a ride someplace. We're wealthy. And so this is to us as well. So pay attention. I want you to realize that James, while he primarily is speaking to the wealthy, and it is a warning to the wealthy, this is a reminder to you and me of the trappings and the pursuit of worldly goods, wealth, and good things. See, ultimately, I believe the temptation to be wealthy is a temptation to be self-reliant. We say, I don't mind being a Christian, but I want to know where everything's coming from. I want control over my life. I want to know that my bills will be paid. I want to know that I have enough money. I want to see more money in my bank account. It's a self-reliance. But that leads to what we might refer to or call today a self-made man or a self-made woman. And we honor that in our society. How many times have you heard that? Oh, he's a self-made man. Do you know what the problem is with a self-made man? He tends to worship his creator. Let that sink in for a minute. A self-made man worships his creator. Self-made? I worship myself. God won't allow you to get away with that because that's going to lead you astray. By his grace, he wants you to understand you rely on him. And so the first thing we're looking at is the judgment is coming. That's verse 1. What judgment? And James gives us three areas. Three areas that judgment is coming. Look at verse 2. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Your treasure has rotted. What is he talking about? Then, like now, some things never change. The wealthy were rated based on the foods that they ate, the abundance of food, having banquets and having an abundance of food. Their clothes. Did they go to Brooks Brothers or did they go to Walmart? Uh, their, their riches, their gold, their silver, which has always been a sign of wealth, has it not? You see, this becomes not only a sign of power and of wealth, but the problem becomes with these riches is that we don't own them. They own you. And that's always the temptation. There has been said um, before that out of every hundred men who can withstand severe trials, only one can withstand success. Success tends to ruin men and women. Goes to our heads. The riches tend to control us. And so while James has a, con a, a condemnatory tone here, he is not condemning riches. You do understand that, right? He's not condemning riches, money, wealth, homes, Houses, none of that. As a matter of fact, some of the biblical characters we read about were incredibly rich. Abraham was incredibly rich. Had his own army. David was incredibly rich. Solomon, rich beyond belief. No, what he's condemning here is our attitude. 
towards money. Look at verse 3 at the end again. He says, it is in the last days that you have stored up for your treasure. You're hoarding your treasure. You're hoarding it. It's all about you. I remind you that the Apostle Paul, in talking to Timothy, many people will say, oh yeah, money, filthy lucre. You know, money's the root of all evil. You know that's wrong, right? If Paul says this, it, for the love of money, our attitude towards money, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And then he goes on to say, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Listen to these words and let them impact you. And pierced themselves with many griefs in the pursuit for riches, in the pursuit that for something that is just a vapor. Poof here today going tomorrow. You see, this idea of greed is intentional. The greed is a net that Satan uses to catch men like a fisherman catches fish. He throws the lure out there for greed, for money, to achieve. And then he catches them and nets them so that he might destroy them. Money's not evil, folks. It's not good or bad. It's amoral. It's not a moral decision. It's our attitude towards it. And this can impact you, and this can impact me. It's something that we deal with sometimes on a daily basis. The Proverbs 13.8 a man's riches may ransom his life. Hear that? A man's riches may ransom his life. Kidnap him. But a poor man hears no threat. There's freedom. There's freedom there. I remind you, and you know this, there's three things money can't do. And I say again, the Bible doesn't speak against money. It speaks about our attitude towards money. That we don't control it, it controls us. We don't own it, it owns us if we're not careful, if we're not good stewards, if we're not generous with it. Three things money cannot do. It cannot buy happiness. You all know that, right? I would gladly give all my millions for just one last marital success. And who said that? J. Paul Getty. J. Paul Getty said, I would gladly give all my millions for just one last marital success. You would think that guy would be happy. It cannot bring lasting satisfaction. When a reporter asked John D. Rockefeller, how much will be enough? He replied, when I have a little more. I remind you, he was the first American billionaire with a B. And considering he reached this in the early 1900s, he today is still considered one of the richest men in modern history. And yet, billions were not enough. Can't we learn from that? The pursuit of money, don't we know that in our hearts? And so it cannot buy happiness, it cannot bring lasting satisfaction, and it cannot go with you. It is reported that when uh, one of the Vanderbilts died, the family was waiting in an outer room. And when he had passed, the doctor and the family lawyer came out. One of the family members rather impatiently asked the lawyer, how much did he leave? And the lawyer very quickly looked at him and he said, all of it. <laughs> Money is temporal. Money makes life easier, but it does not buy happiness. It does not buy satisfaction. And it cannot go with you. It's something that God gives us to be used now and to be used for his kingdom. To be used for you. For you to buy your house and to buy food and to live because he loves you and wants to take care of you. There's a second judgment. Look at verse 4. Behold, 
When you see behold, think, take a look at this. Look, right here. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields in which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. The second judgment. We become so engrossed in trying to achieve more that many times the rich will cheat others. One of the first lessons I learned in business many years ago was the very people, if there's one thing they had enough of, it was money. And yet they were cheap, many of them. They hoarded their money. <coughs> it's that kind of attitude. Now, I'm not saying all are. There are some folks who money has never controlled them. God has entrusted them with a lot, and they've always been generous with it, and they've always helped others out. But I want you to take note here that what happens is we turn from a generous lifestyle to a we first lifestyle. And so back in James's time, the wealthy were not only wealthy for good reasons, they were wealthy for taking advantage of other people. Somebody would work their fields and they would defraud them and not pay them. That doesn't go on today, does it? <laughs> But what's interesting here is that James says this cries out. That this cries out against you. The outcry of those reach the ears the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is pointing at God's omnipotence, the all-powerful one, the Lord of hosts, the one that controls the armies of heaven, the cry reaches out to him. Now, who can stand against him? Good picture, isn't it? Do you have someone who's taken advantage of you in your past and then laughed at you until this day they will not repay? Do you realize that their injustice cries up to God? Do you realize God hears? Do you realize that he will judge that? You see, the employers may turn a deaf ear. Those who take advantage may turn a deaf ear. God does not. He listens, he hears, and he's patient. The third judgment we see in verses 5 and 6. So far we've seen there will be a judgment on greed for those who are greedy and living for themselves. Apart from God, I don't need God, I have this covered. Uh, they have even cheated and defrauded others because they only see themselves in their own pursuits. Last, they exalt themselves. Uh, they've gone from a me-first lifestyle to a me-only philosophy. Dog eat dog. Okay? Look at verse 5. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. Oh, it's all good, right? You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Ooh, what a gruesome picture. You know, that would have really impacted the Jewish audience that he was writing to. They all spent time at the temple and they watched animals being slaughtered and sacrificed. James says, that's you. There's a day coming when you're going to be sacrificed like that. Verse 6, you have condemned and put to death the righteous man. There's some arguments on what that righteous man is. I believe that it is the righteous people that have worked for you, who did not stand against you, men and women who did right things and you took advantage of. The common worker. The righteous man. He did not even resist you and you stole from him. You defrauded him. And so James is pointing out very clearly you rich, be very careful. There's a day of accountability coming. You think that your life is whatever you want it to be, and it's been smooth and it's been good. But there's a day coming when God will say, I have trusted all of this money to you. What did you do with it? And he already knows the answer. So how do we apply this? 
There's a judgment day coming. We know that. We also know that the judgments on the rich, those who live for themselves, will be harsh. That's what James is talking about here. And he's trying to slap them awake. And by God's grace, he's saying, finger in your chest. Please wake up. Wake up. It's not too late. It's not too late. But the first thing we can do in applying this is we can adapt God's view. Now, forward, go forward in your Bibles up to the book of Luke. This is just one example. In the book of Luke, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we find this story. Jesus was uh, asked by someone in a crowd as Jesus was teaching. And this person said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And Jesus' answer was, but Who am I? Who appointed me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And then he told them this parable. And this parable you are familiar with. Jesus said, starting in verse 16, Luke 12, starting in verse 16, and Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God, this is the part that we don't realize. But God said to him, You fool. Here is a man that is pictured. He's living for himself apart from God has no need for God, even though God is the one that watered and caused that fruit and that, that planting to be a, a bumper harvest, a bumper crop. He only thinks of himself. He's going to live for himself and only think of himself. And God says, you're a fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life, as to what you will eat, nor for your body, as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Jesus is telling the disciples, don't get trapped in making more. Don't get trapped into having better clothes. Be content with what you have because there's so much out there you're missing. There's so much you're missing. And you have myopic view on your own possessions and you're missing life. Verse 24, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? See, Jesus took them from, I've got to make this work, to God will make this work. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You see, God doesn't want you worrying about making ends meet. He wants you to be a good steward. He wants you to take care of your finances. It's important but he doesn't want them controlling you. The first thing I want you to do is adapt a godly view towards your finances. God's in charge. He's lent it to you. Use it wisely. Be generous. The second thing, you can't do this if you are apart from Christ. Have you come to a point in your life where you've said, God, I can't do this on my own. I don't know where I'm going when I die. I don't know that I really have a relationship with you. I'm religious. I'm in church. I know the Bible. But I don't feel like I have a relationship with you. There's something missing. God has an answer for you. You see, he tells us, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God, we've all messed up. 
We've all done wrong, wrong things, right? All of us. Even today. Already. God says, I know. Well, nobody's perfect, God. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. For all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin are death. In other words, death means separation. Separation means when we die, if you're separated from God, there's only two places to go. Heaven or hell. And so, what the Bible tells us is that we've all sinned and we're all headed towards hell. But, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Is that music to your ears? Oh, it should be. Trust in Christ. Please trust in Christ. If you were in the hospital right now and somebody walked in, the doctor had already told you, you have lung cancer, you're not going to make it through the week. And you had someone walk into that room and they said, Doc, can you take my lungs and put them in you? And take your cancer and put it in them. And the doctor did it. What would happen to you if you had good, healthy lungs? Why, well, you would live, wouldn't you? What would happen to that friend that took your cancer lungs? Well, they would die. Right? They would die in your place. You see, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. He died in your place. And he left you with a choice. And that choice is, you can pay for your own sins. Please don't. Please don't go that route. Or you can let Jesus pay for your sins. How can I do that? The Bible says, for it is by grace, you are saved by faith. And it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. What does God require? To come to Him and humbly submit to God. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've missed the mark. I know I've done wrong. I know I'm not perfect. And I'm asking you to forgive my sins. And will. Turn to Christ. Have you done that? You only need to do it once. Have you done that? Trust in Christ. And God will give you eternal life. And when you have that eternal life, you can do the things that I'm talking about here because God gives you the Holy Spirit to guide, to convict, to lead you. We can adapt God's view concerning riches. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. We must trust in Christ. Now we enter into a very deep relationship with God and we become a child of God. Before that, we were a creation of God. Believer, I want to talk to you. Believer, is there someone who has defrauded you? Is there someone who manipulated you out of a job? Is there someone who stole from you maybe decades ago? Is there someone that still laughs at you, how they took advantage of you? Is there a, an Enron out there that where people defrauded you out of your life savings? And God isn't doing a thing. I want you to remember that God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Their sin cries out to God, and God will make it right. And so I'm asking you to do something that is superhuman. Forgive them. Forgive them. Now, if there's an opportunity for you to get back what you should, you're not giving that up. But I am saying forgive them. Turn it over to God. Don't live with that pain. Don't live with that bitterness. It'll eat you alive. I want you to remember these words. This was eating this man alive. It's a psalm written by Asaph. And he says this, Surely God is good to Israel. You can read it later, but it's Psalm 73. I'm going to drop right down to verse 3. For I was envious of the arrogant, as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. That's a good thing. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like mankind. Therefore, pride 
is their necklace. The garment of violence covers them. Their eye bulges from fatness. The imaginations of their heart run riot. They mock and wickedly speak of oppression. You get in the picture? These are rich, arrogant people. And nothing bad happens to them. Nothing. Nobody judges them. They get away with it day after day after day. And I drop down. Asaph says this. When I pondered to understand this, it was troublesome in my sight until I came into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when aroused, you will despise their form. It is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of a holy God. One day, that will happen to those who have taken advantage of you and refused to repent and refused to come to Christ. And I want you to leave that with God so that you don't live with that. I want you to remember that God loves you deeply. That he sent his son to die for you. That God will take care of your finances. It doesn't give you an excuse to be reckless. But I want you to recognize there's a very firm warning here to the wealthy who are living like there is no God. And there's a very firm reminder for you and me. Don't let riches control you. Let Christ control you. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that you love us deeply, that you gave your Son to us, and that you have given us eternal life for those who will turn to you and trust in Christ. Father, for those who are wealthy, those who are living apart from you, those who are not condemned because of their wealth, but their attitude towards their wealth. Those who, like the man in the opening story, who are counting on their wealth to get them everything. Their money, their clothes, their food. They think that they can buy their way into heaven with a good meal. They can dress for success or literally buy their way in with their riches. Would you work in their hearts? Convert them? Open up the eyes of their heart that they would see Jesus. And Lord, I pray, if there's anyone here today who has been, for the first time, learned that they can trust in Christ and have eternal life, that they would come and they would let us know. They would let me know. And Father, if there's anyone here who has been holding it against someone else because they have been greatly wronged, they have been defrauded. They were lied to. They have been despised and laughed at. But they could turn that great pain over to you. And you would carry it for them so that they can be free. Free them today. Father, when we forgive, it has been wisely said. When we forgive, the prisoner is set free. And then we find out the prisoner was me. God, may they be free today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Please pray with me. Our Father, we have worshipped you corporately together. Our hearts are full. We have heard your word. We've committed to obey your word. We desire to live in obedience to you. Because you are the one who made us. And you want the very, very best for us. Because you love us deeply. So much so that you gave your son. Lord, I pray that we would leave here today, tell others about our Lord and Savior, that they too might trust, and they have eternal life as well. For we understand, Father, that while we can't take money to heaven, we can take a friend. And so, Father, we ask, give us boldness, opportunity, and words to tell others about our Savior Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.